it's won and it's gotten up there and now it's just facing um, threats that have to do with its habitat running out and, and threats that have to do with uh, the the problem associated with its lifestyle it needs a lot of space to reproduce and have a healthy population and that's probably what's going on right now it has a small handful of genes a variation to go with but remember it took 10 million years to make a cheetah from the original ancestor of all cats and in that 10 million years it produced one hell of an adaptive creature one that can run faster than any land animal on earth one that is extremely successful in chasing down prey probably evolved to catch the pronghorns in North America which were the second fastest species that were on earth and now it's in Africa and it does pretty well as long as it has the space and it doesn't get out competed by some of the other species which don't like it like tigers and hyenas so the mix of, of threats an association that something like the cheetah can get is a conservation story played over and over again with endangered species. And as we understand the interaction between the ecology, the genetics, the natural history, the present situation, the attitude of the people that live in the area, and, and all of the things that mix into trying to bring our planet into a balance, I think we're better equipped to advise managers about what is the best way to manage these populations with a little bit of information rather than just simply guesswork. When I was younger, it was guesswork 95% of the time. Today, I see at conservation workshops agenda items such as molecular genetics, diversity, reproductive, biomedical, infectious diseases. Biomedical technologies is weighing in on assessing endangered species in ways that, that I'm quite impressed with because it's a large responsibility to make decisions to try to play God about saving an endangered species. And the more information that we have, the more equipped we are to be able to defend our decisions because a lot of people are going to criticize the decision no matter what you decide. So if you have the data and you can lay it out on the table, then this is the kind of ammunition and, and, and uh, information that's really needed to make these decisions. So down in the end, to get back to your original question, how many genes, how much variation is there? There's less variation in the cheetah than there are in, other, in many species. But if you start looking at lots of mammals and quantifying the amount of variation that's present, there are other species or populations that are even worse, like the gear lion and the florid panther. And there are others that are much better, like the leopard has a lot of variation. Tigers are about the same as cheetahs, actually, and they're... They're, they're holding their own when the habitat tat's okay. They coalesce back to a, a, a large volcanic eruption that occurred in Indonesia about 70,000 years ago. All tiger genetic diversity goes back to that. And that pretty much eliminated most of the large mammals in the Sun Shelf region at that time. Including, and it had a, had a big effect on, the, on these tigers, which then set up their, their, their uh, uh, populations across the range. So, I think that, that, that we're beginning to read in the genes the secrets and the footprints, if you will, of historic events like this. And the cheetah's genetic heritage is unusual, but mercifully, it hasn't written the death sentence for the cheetah. In fact, quite the opposite. This has invigorated our knowledge, our understanding, and equipped the managers who must pay attention to the biology and the science of conservation with the kinds of judgments that can be quantified and used to predict outcomes in ways that are a lot more sensible than back of the envelope or knee-jerk reactions, which was going on when I was a young man first looking at conservation. Say something nice now about Cheetah Conservation Fund. <laughs> <laughs> and you only have a couple seconds or minutes, maybe. <coughs> I think that the Cheetah Conservation Fund... Just a second. Start that again. Okay. Well, I'm proud to be a supporter and a member of the, of the governing board of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. It, it represents a, a dream of a young woman, uh, Lori Marker, who I met 25 years ago, to uh, focus conservation efforts uh, on uh, a beloved predator, uh, an icon of conservation, the African cheetah, but in the context of community involvement and the interaction of the of the people who live in, in, in the country where the cheetah's habitat is the highest. I think that uh, uh, decisions were made about how to put this out, education programs were set up, and we're now seeing a, uh, 
a program for conservation of the cheetah in Namibia that has the potential of really influencing the next generation of conservation programs throughout Africa and Asia to boot. Uh, I'm very proud to be associated with it. I think that there's a lot of, of positive things that are, that are coming out of it. I think that more positive things could come out of it as we begin to understand that endangered species conservation is a goal that is shared by many people in every culture across the world. And it, it isn't hard to find somebody in each one of these countries who wants to see conservation happen. And CCF seeks out these people, gets them to join in the cause, and really turns around what was a really mindless destruction and decimation of, uh, of endangered species for many generations up until very few years ago. Thank I don't you. Know what you want to say, but well done.